هلا صرنا لايف Shall we start? Okay, hello uh, everyone. So today, today is a, a, a special event for us here at the UB. It's, uh, it's uh, an occasion to celebrate uh, and honor the work and life of uh, Freeman Dyson. Uh, I will not uh, say too much about the award, uh, I will leave that to the president, who will be introducing uh, Freeman as he's about to uh, deliver his lecture around 6 p.m. We are rather uh, constrained uh, on time, and uh, we have here put together a panel, which I like to think of as a prelude for uh, the lecture, a prelude for uh, the local audience in particular, which may or may not be familiar by uh, Freeman's contribution to uh, science, society, uh, discussion of technology and its impact on uh, society, as well as reflections by uh, the role of the scientist in the public sphere, which we hope to uh, bring to light in the panel that we have put together. So, as things stand, I have very few minutes to uh, prepare the ground uh, for uh, uh, the panelists. Uh, I am in the position of a person introducing the event, as well as perhaps giving a brief take, which is rather personal, on what this award is all about. Uh, so, we put together a panel which includes uh, Professor Tamir Amin from the Department of Education. He is uh, a specialist in uh, science education. And together we have been uh, quite engaged in the question of the role of the scientist in the public sphere, working on the dissemination of uh, science and mathematics generated here at AUB, within AUB, and outside. So he put together an interesting reading of uh, Freeman's uh, work uh, under the title of Facts, Analogies, and Knowing Whom to Trust. And then uh, we uh, had intended to have a section related to the scientific contribution of Freeman uh, Dyson, uh, but that did not pan out as planned, and uh, so I will also be talking a bit about my perception of Freeman as a rebel at the nexus of science, uh, technology, and society. And to bring uh, to life uh, the intimate connection or engagement of Freeman uh, with issues of the world, the region in particular, we thought it appropriate to uh, invite uh, Dr. Imad Barghouti from uh, Al-Quds University, a physicist, uh, space plasma physicist from Al-Quds uh, University, to talk about uh, science and solidarity when it, when it comes to his doing science uh, under occupation and the connection that brought him to uh, Freeman when a, few, a couple of years back uh, he was uh, uh, detained. And so there would be a video message. Unfortunately, he could not make it uh, to Beirut, and we tried to get him through live uh, streaming. That also proved difficult. So he pre-recorded the video message, uh, which is a 12-minute message uh, for us, and we'll be streaming it after uh, the presentation by uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Amin. Uh, what I have to say is something that is uh, fully, fully known to Freeman, since it will be actually uh, 
a reflection on his uh, contributions as experienced by a scientist, a young scientist, uh, then uh, someone who's actually engaged with pedagogy and eventually someone who's thinking carefully about the administration of science at AUB and in the country. So that is something that uh, can wait. And with that in mind, I would like to start with uh, a Professor Amin's presentation, which actually is, in some sense, a reflection of his uh, reaction to an intensive immersion with uh, Freeman's writing and what they had to say to him as a science educator at the present moment. So, Tamer, can you please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jihad. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And um, uh, I had been, uh, I had encountered uh, Freeman Dyson's writing quite a few years ago. Uh, briefly, and then this opportunity gave me a chance to uh, sort of return to some of his essays and lectures in print and uh, reacquaint myself with, uh, with his writing. So this was a great opportunity for me, and I enjoyed it very much. Um, and so what I'd like to do is just share my reflections that emerge from, from this uh, reacquaintance um, and hope that this provides some uh, uh, food for thought and, uh, and a useful sort of introduction to this, uh, to this event. Um, so I'll, I'll get right to it. So there are a variety of ways in which scientists engage with the general public. Uh, some scientists with pedagogical inclinations set aside time to communicate wa the wonder of science through carefully selected demonstrations to surprise and excite, hoping that these might increase the interest of non-scientists, especially younger people in science. A notable example is actually the Lebanese-born chemist Bassem Shahashiri, who is the director of the Wisconsin Initiative for Science Literacy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a past president of the American Chemical Society. Uh, another way scientists engage with the public is to clarify the practical implications of their work and to make lifestyle recommendations that follow from their research. Uh, our own Najat Saliba, the professor of uh, analytical chemistry at AUB, has been active in alerting us to the health implications of her research on air quality in Lebanon and her important work on the hazardous components of water pipe smoke. Uh, some scientists try to explain difficult ideas in their area of expertise in an accessible way. Um, a master at this is the evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins who held the chair in the public understanding of science at Oxford for a number of years. He has gifted us a number of evocative metaphors for how designs emerge in the natural world without designers. Uh, the blind watchmaker or the climbing Mount Improbable are a couple of these metaphors. He has used these as titles for two of my favorite, favorite books of his for a general reader. Um, the charismatic 20th century Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman is another scientist with a reputation for communicating effectively with non-scientists. Feynman's writing or lecturing for a more general audience is not easy to categorize, but an approach he sometimes took, uh, which I think is special and quite unique to him, is that he tried to communicate deep ideas about the nature of scientific ideas. Um, a clear example is his lecture, The Character of Physical Law, where he doesn't just try to explain Newton's law of gravitation to us, but he helps us get a sense of what kind of thing a physical law actually is, using the law of gravitation just as an example. Uh, today we're honoring Professor Freeman Dyson, a theoretical physicist and mathematician who has written and lectured extensively in an effort to engage non-scientists. His book, Birds and Frogs, uh, a compiled collection of his papers and essays from 1990 to 2014, and many of which are written versions of talks that he gave, give a sense of his range. Uh, apart from some technical papers, the collection includes essays about a variety of scientific topics, reflections on the lives of scientists he has known, and a collection of essays, talks uh, on politics and history. Uh, this last set illustrates another way in which a scientist can engage with the general public. Uh, in this case, the scientist uses his or her scientific habits of mind 
to think through issues of general societal concern. The fears of research on genetic engineering, the ethical considerations of the development and use of nuclear weapons, or how to deal with the concerns of climate change. Some of these issues might, have, might involve drawing on scientific expertise in a particular area, but often they involve drawing on scientific ways of thinking to extend beyond one's expertise. Uh, it is here that I think scientists' engagement, engagement with the general public can be most significant, and where Freeman Dyson's contributions to society beyond his technical scientific contributions stand out. So let me unpack this a bit. Uh, in a 2009 lecture entitled Nukes and Genomes, Professor Dyson comes to the seemingly counterintuitive conclusion that unilateral disarmament, nuclear or otherwise, is a good thing and is usually more effective than multilateral negotiation. He makes his argument based on a discussion of four historical examples between the early 1960s and mid-1980s in which disarmament was attempted on a significant scale. Three of the, these examples were successful, and two of which, two of them, involved unilateral action. In this lecture, he goes on to advocate attempts at disarmament of either kind, but he points, uh, he points out that calls for nuclear disarmament are often resisted on the grounds that maintaining nuclear weapons gives a nation security. Uh, an argument that itself draws on the claim that the use of nuclear bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki brought World War II to an end. Dyson dispels this myth by laying out a series of facts presented by the historian Ward Wilson, indicating instead that the Japanese decision to surrender was not caused by these bombings. Dyson's discussion of the viability of large-scale disarmament and the most effective approaches to it is one example of how he draws carefully on facts and their logical consequences to arrive at often counterintuitive, unpopular, or uncomfortable conclusions. Dyson gave another talk a year uh, earlier, entitled The Individual or the Group, a question that arises in science, law, and language. He divides this talk into three parts. In the first, he discusses an, an, uh, an analysis offered by the Cambridge anthropologist Caroline Humphrey of the American notion of freedom and the extent to which it translates easily to other languages. Her analysis focuses on three words in Russian, uh, none of which map neatly onto the individualistic sense of the English word freedom. Instead, the words incorporate some notion of group membership. The second part of his talk turns to an article by a Washington lawyer uh, critical of the decision by the United, United States Supreme Court in 1977. The case at issue involved a white student who, has, uh, who was denied admission to the University of California at Davis. The university's admission policies involved them setting aside 16 places out of every 100 for students of specified minority groups. So the white student who was denied admission sued the university on the grounds that the university had violated the Civil Rights Act of 1964, prohibiting discrimination based on race. The Supreme Court of California found in favor of the student, and this decision was then upheld by the Supreme Court of the United States and continued to function as a precedent for similar cases when public schools and universities attempted to set up programs to provide special opportunities for members of racial minority groups. The article Dyson discusses in the second part of his lecture was critical of the Supreme Court favoring the rights of the individual over the rights of the group, especially a group disadvantaged by past discrimination. The third part of the lecture addressed a debate between Dyson and Richard Dawkins over the degree to which individual level selection is sufficient to explain evolutionary phenomena, which Dawkins uh, thinks is sufficient, or whether the appeal to group level selection is also necessary, as Do uh, Dyson himself uh, believes, especially when explaining human evolution. At the end of this lecture, Dyson notes the parallels between these three discussions in the disparate domains of language, the law, and evolutionary biology, all invoking the tension between individual and group-level thinking. 
He concludes by encouraging us not to neglect group level thinking and therein lies, and I quote, the road to a freer and more peaceful world. On display in this lecture is another scientific habit of mine, the use of analogies. Using disciplined analysis of anal analogous cases, extracting their deeper structure so that we can think about something we found challenging in a new and productive way. In this case, he has applied his scientific habit of mind so that the notions of rights and freedom take on new group and community level meanings. I've mentioned two scientific habits of mind reflected in Dyson's engagement with issues of general public interest. The use of facts, sometimes leading to counterintuitive, unpopular, or uncomfortable conclusions, and the disciplined use of analogies to make mental leaps to new ways of thinking, I want to now bring up a third, knowing whom to trust. Trusting others is not often listed as a feature of scientific thinking. In fact, drawing your own conclusions based on the relevant facts and your own disciplined reasoning is often seen as the hallmark of scientific thinking. And this is contrasted with simply accepting the views of others typically in some position of authority. But this contrast doesn't quite work. Trusting others is a feature of scientific thinking. So let me, let me elaborate. Um, first, let me say that trust figures in the way that we use our very basic concepts all the time. Uh, consider your concepts of materials like silver or gold. Uh, you certainly know things about these materials, what they typically look like and feel like. You know that gold is more valuable, probably because it, was, it is more rare in nature and harder to mine. Uh, you will have used that concept of gold happily for many years before you encounter, maybe for the first time, white gold. It's nice, but it looks a, little like, a lot like silver. You inquire and you, you're told that it is real gold, but an alloy with some other white metals mixed in. And because it's made of real gold, it's still more expensive than silver. So you accept that on trust, possibly based on the reputation of the jeweler, and pay the higher price even though it looks a lot like something that is less expensive. Now, philosophers and psychologists have a lot to say about the nature of human concepts, and many now have converged on the conclusion that trust figures centrally in the way we use concepts. This is not the time to get into all that, but let me give one more example. Let's say I show you a horse, and I ask you what it is, and because it has the typical features of a horse, a head shaped just so, the mane, and tail of a certain length, you identify it quickly as a horse. Then I get some paint and paint black and white stripes on its body. Again, I ask you now, what do you think it is? You humor me and smile and say, still a horse, you just painted it. This game continues and I say, well, what if I skin the horse and I put the skin and fur of a zebra on it? You still insist it's still a horse. I then describe a transformation involving inner organs and eventually I describe something very intrusive, maybe implicating some transformation of structure within the cells of the horse that make it look and behave like a zebra. What I've described is a task designed by the developmental psychologist Frank Kyle that has been given to adults and children of various ages. What is found is that even children resist the conclusion that superficial transformations result in the animal changing in kind. As the transformations become more internal, accepting that a change in kind has taken place becomes more likely. With adults, you could say that this indicates more biological knowledge about the fact that something like DNA makes an animal what it is. But typical adults don't know much about DNA, really. Certainly young children as young as six or seven don't know much biology, but they still respond to these transformation scenarios as if they believe that there is something inside the animal that makes it the kind of thing that it is. Even if they don't know what that thing is. Children and adults' concepts of animals and other natural kinds, including materials like silver and gold, seem to function like this. We assume there is something inside the thing that defines its nature. We don't know what that thing is, and we trust that others, experts of some kind, know and can, che can check definitively what kind of thing we are dealing with. 
So I share these ideas about concepts to point out that trust plays a deep role in how we think about the world and the things in it. But this is not just a feature of everyday undisciplined thinking. It is a feature of how scientists think as well. The experimental scientist in the lab knows something about how her instruments work, but treats, um, excuse me, but treats the, uh, I've lost my train of thought here. So the experimental scientist in the lab knows something about uh, how her instruments work, but trust that the original designers and the manufacturer. Uh, the paleontologist drawing conclusions about evolution based on an analysis of fossils assumes a temporal sequencing of these fossils, trusting the geologist's dating of the rocks in which they were found. This kind of trust and its role in drawing conclusions about issues of societal concern find their way uh, or find their place in Dyson's essays and lectures as well. I mentioned his essay on disarmament and his willingness to reject the popular assumption that the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki led to the Japanese surrender in World War II, based on the arguments presented by the historian Ward Wilson. Now, Wilson did present facts that Dyson cites, but I assume that Dyson did not consult the primary sources that Wilson used. He trusted the historian's academic rigor. I've now mentioned three scientific habits of mind that Dyson draws on as he engages with issues of general societal interest, fact-based reasoning, creative analogical thinking, and trust. But, there are not, but these are not independent of each other. A scientist's creative analogical leaps have to be constrained by the facts. And the individual a scientist trusts has to, in turn, have demonstrated that he or she exercises these other scientific habits of mind. Reading Dyson's essays or hearing his lectures allows us to see this blend of mental habits skillfully applied to the issues that concern uh, all of us, increasing the chances that we will exercise similar habits ourselves when we consider issues that are important to us and our communities. I'd like to end with a comment about why I think all of this is important, and now. Uh, we seem to be living at a time in which the general public's trust in scientists is strained. The issue of the human contribution to climate change in particular is frequently mentioned as an example of how, despite the scientific consensus, too many scientists, including those in positions of power, don't trust what scientists are saying. There are all sorts of things that might be said to explain this lack of trust. But I would suggest that one explanation is that scientists have typically done a very poor job of sharing their thinking processes with the general public. I would single out how and why scientists trust other scientists as a habit of mind that must be opened up to public scrutiny and engagement. Freeman Dyson's engagement with the general public does exactly that. Indeed, he has controversially not shied away from publicly questioning the soundness of predictions of climate change models. He has been criticized for undermining public trust in the conclusions of climate change research as a result. But this criticism is misplaced if trusting scientists is actually based on our access to and appreciation of their scientific habits of mind. So one may, uh, one may not agree with all Freeman Dyson's conclusions, but that's beside the point. He invites us to engage in sustained, thoughtful, fact-based reflection while drawing selectively from the work of others to arrive at conclusions that may be unpopular, but reflect a commitment to fundamental human values. So it is entirely appropriate that he be presented with AUB's first Presidential Science and Humanism Award. Thank you very much. reading of science and work through uh, Freeman's work through the lens of uh, facts, analogies, and uh, trust. Uh, we are short on time, so we will immediately move to uh, the pre-recorded message by uh, Dr. Imad uh, Barghouti. Uh,
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Dear respected audience peace be upon you welcome everybody first of all I would like to thank the American University of Beirut AUB for giving me this opportunity to participate in this respected event and <clears throat> to say thank you to our respected Professor Freeman Dyson for his scientific contribution as a physicist. I respect a lot his physics contribution, his scientific contribution. In addition, I have to thank him again for his engagement in different international public issues. One of these public issues was his support, his solidarity with me when I was in Israeli prisons, first arrest and second arrest, Professor Dyson with many international respected scientists wrote a letter to Nature Journal Many scientists wrote different letters in different magazines, different reports to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, to Israeli Defense Minister, to Israeli Education Minister, and asking them they have to release Professor Barghouti from their Israeli prisons and jails. Without your support, our respected guest, Without the support of the international community, I won't be here and giving this little talk. I won't be among my family, among my students in my office with my students. Therefore, I have to stand up and to say thank you, Professor Dyson, for yourself and your respected colleagues and our respected international scientists for their support and solidarity. Thank you. Respected audience, as a Palestinian living under occupation, as a university professor in Al-Quds University, I would like to summarize my situation with a joke and with a fact. The joke is always, I'm kidding, joking with my department head, the chairman of the physics department at Quds University. Always I'm teasing him, talking to him and telling him, please, dear head, don't give me hard time. Don't give me tough task or jobs. I don't like this time. Maybe I don't like this course. Just kidding with him, talking with him. Otherwise, if you give me hard time and I don't like it, I go to my Facebook profile and write a post and just put a Palestinian flag or a picture or a photo of a Palestinian martyr. And next day, the Israeli soldier, they will come and pick me up and you, Mr. Head, will do the job. Therefore, don't give me hard time. This is the joke which summarizes my situation. I am 24 hours under the threat of the Israeli soldiers. The fact that I am living in is the following. Always this sack is with me in my car, in my bedroom, in my office. This sack, it has towel, pajama, and shoes. Why? Because the Israelis maybe will arrest me at any time. The first arrest arrested me on the Palestinian Israeli Jordanian border when I was traveling uh, to a scientific meeting in United Arab Emirates that was in the December uh, uh, 
2014. And the second arrest arrested me while I'm in the entrance of my hometown, uh, Betrima. And I have to have something to change my clothes when I'm in prison. Therefore, this sack is attached to me. This is the situation that I am living. <coughs> this is due to the Israeli occupation. <coughs> On 4th of October, around 40 days ago, the Israeli military intelligence, Captain Nidal, he's responsible for Bethlehem region, called me in the afternoon and told me, Professor Baguthi, you have to come to my office in Bethlehem and we have to have a meeting with each other. I told him, I'm from north of Ramallah, far from Bethlehem. Why to come to Bethlehem? If you want me, let me meet in the Israeli intelligence office in Ramallah region. He said, no, you have to come to my office in Bethlehem. I have to go around two hours drive. And I went on Sunday, 10.30 in the morning, according to his uh, uh, call. And in the, in the meeting, <coughs> I told him, what will happen if I didn't come? He said, you don't know what will happen? I know, but I asked him that question. Respected audience, maybe in the same week, the Israeli intelligence called a young man 24 years ago, 24, 24 years old, from my hometown, Betrima, in north of Ramallah city. They called him and they asked him to come to their office. He didn't go. They asked him another time, second call. He didn't go. On the third day, they came to his house in the early morning, they didn't knock on the door. They broke the door, entered his bedroom, into his bed, attacked him and beat him till death. And he died in his bed. I, I didn't go and meet this captain, Israeli military intelligence. Maybe he will come to my bedroom and attacked me in my bedroom. Maybe he will he arrest me, he will pick me up in front of my wife and children. Maybe he will attack me. Maybe will he keep beating me uh, till death. Therefore, I went and I met him. And uh, he told me, Imad, I asked you to come to my office because you are an, a Palestinian activist. I don't know what's wrong with that. Yes, I'm a Palestinian. I am a university professor living under occupation. You are taking my land. You are building settlements in my land. You are cutting my trees. You are blocking me from going around. You are giving me hard time. You are not allowing me to go to Jordan, to go to the world, to enter, uh, attend different meetings all over the world. And I have to protest that. The international law, the international community, the respected scientists from all over, the, all over the world, they support me because I have to protest to get my right to live according to the international law. He told me, just be a university professor and that's enough. I told him, how come many Israeli scientists look at Yuval Niman, he's a full professor, he's a well-known particle physicist, and he served in the Israeli as a minister for energy. Many university professors from Hebrew University, from Technion, from different universities, in summer they serve in the army. They serve their country. They defend their country. And I am not allowed to defend my country. No, I will keep defending my country, protest this Israeli occupation, and keep calling for this incubation to end and keep working to reach, to have our independent Palestine. As an activist in Palestine, 
I live under different threat from the Israelis. Sometimes they don't let me reach my office. Sometimes they don't let me go from one city to another city. 100% they don't allow me to come to this respected meeting. Shake hands with this respected professor from AUB, from Lebanon, different uh, countries, to communicate with my friends, my colleagues. They are blocking me from being outside to attend different scientific uh, meeting. And, but I refuse to be like that. I will keep calling my friends, my colleagues, the scientific community, the social community, we have to work together to liberate our Palestine. Yes, I am a university professor, I am professor of physics, but in the same time, and the Palestine, I am a Palestinian under occupation, I have to keep working to liberate uh, my country, and I know I'm going to pay a lot. Yes, they arrested me, and put me under administrative detention, maybe because of this video, because of this uh, uh, contribution, they will arrest me and they will put me in their prisons again and again. But I will keep talking till we reach our independent country. I have to thank you. I have to say again and again, thank you and Deeply, we need your support, your solidarity. We need to live in peace. And this will never ever happen till we have our independent Palestine. I wish next time be among you, shake hands with all of you. Thank you very much. Bye. I uh, should let you guys know that we um, received Dr. Barghouti's uh, message uh, this morning. I did not get a chance to hear it, and I'm particularly moved uh, by what he had to say. It brings a, a new level of urgency to the notion of a scientist engaged in shaping, transforming uh, the reality. Something that I know uh, our uh, honoree has strived to do uh, all his life, since early days of engagement in, as a civilian scientist in a war effort, Second World War effort, onto uh, engagement with nuclear disarmament and then uh, engaging with the issues of the time uh, climate change included. Uh, before uh, switching uh, the streaming from our end, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, all the people who uh, contributed to making uh, bringing this event together First and foremost, I want to thank uh, President Khoury for this initiative, which uh, um, matters uh, uh, profoundly to AUB uh, uh, and the role it wishes to take in terms of uh, the dialogue around um, science, the production of knowledge, and its impact on the public sphere. Uh, second, I want to thank uh, Rami Khouri, who uh, contributed uh, deeply in the early stages of the planning of uh, this whole uh, initiative. Uh, his uh, insights and his uh, eloquence were extremely useful at critical stages in the discussion. I want to also thank uh, Alison Freeland, for, uh, the uh, communication office in New York, I did not meet her personally, but uh, I certainly enjoyed our discussion all through the planning. 
And I want to thank uh, Martin uh, Asser and the communication team here in, Be in Beirut for their uh, effort in disseminating uh, information about the event. I uh, really enjoyed uh, the contributions of the panelists, and I'm afraid uh, time will not permit me to uh, reflect on uh, my personal uh, take on this event, uh, namely a very early fascination with the role that Freeman Dyson has played uh, for us all scientists and civilians as a heretic uh, who is uh, speaking uh, truth to power, not concerned with being right, but certainly concerned with not being vague, as he so aptly put it. Uh, I uh, will leave uh, the floor now. Uh, there will be a few minutes for people to connect things uh, to us from New York. And uh, that's it from Beirut.